So in the last segment, I put the portrait bust together and ho hollowed it out and put it together. Then, since then, I have bisque fired uh, this project. Bisque firing is in a kiln, electric kiln, um, 1880 degrees. Um, the clay, it's not clay anymore. It's now ceramic. It's gone through a process called quartz inversion. That means it's this hard, porous, intermediate stage that is for applying color. There'll be a second firing to fire this color on and make the clay more mature. Uh, this is the characteristic pink color of bisqueware. Uh, it's very flat and porous. I've taped off the face and ears uh, because my first step is to apply color to the hair. I've left some of the hair undone so that you can see some technique that I use. When I see uh, apply underglaze, the let's see underglaze is what it sounds like. It's the color that goes under a glaze. Most sculptors don't like shiny glazes, so sometimes they don't put the glaze on at all. They just use the underglaze for the color. And I'm going to use black and a kind of turquoise blue. I, when I apply uh, underglaze, I always use the traditional palette that a painter would use so that um, I can control the viscosity of the, uh, of the, uh, of the glaze or underglaze. I've always got a spray bottle handy your, that'll be one of your tools that you have. This kind is the pumping up kind that gardeners use. You'll probably use the spray, the handle spray kind. I like my glaze to be, I like my underglaze to be the flowing kind, so I'll add a little bit of water to my palette. Then I always have my spray bottle in one, when, when I'm putting um, underglaze on a very textured surface, like this hair, these braids, the, the bisqueware is so porous that it's so thirsty, it'll grab, but it won't get all down into every little nook and cranny because it, you know, it just grabs the color r right there on the surface. So that's why I always have a water bottle in my hand, and that's why I always water down the color so I'll hit the piece and then jam it down in there. And that, that incur, by spraying it just a little bit, just a little squirt, that encourages it to go down into all the little nooks and crannies where I want the color to be. So now I'm going to go ahead and apply the rest of this. And then um, once I'm when I'm done applying the, the color to the hair, I might come back with a wet sponge. Oh, let me get a wet sponge here. I might come back with a wet sponge later and remove uh, the underglaze in an area of detail like that. Um, and I usually do, yeah. I will be doing that um, on pretty much all of this, um, these beads. So once I've applied the color for the hair, now it's time for the skin and ears. I'm going to remove the um, masking tape that I put on the area I didn't want black. If I get a little bit on there, if I get a little bit of, of the black where I don't want it, I'm not going to freak. Don't freak out. Um, you can wipe it off really easily. And the next layer that I'm applying is going to be more opaque. So that means it won't show through. I always use, you, you will be using disposable brush like this. Uh, if you have a painting class like watercolor, don't bring your good watercolor brushes to the clay class. You'll just ruin them. 
we use these disposable brushes because um, ceramic is very abrasive and not not friendly for um, not not friendly for really uh, fine sable brushes. So as I apply uh, underglaze, the the bisqueware is real thirsty, so it's going to suck up the moisture that's in the it's going to suck up the water that's mixed with the glaze. Um, and so it, it appears to almost dry instantly. And if you'll notice, I use a wiggly shoving or wiggly jamming action to apply the glaze. Um, beginners will sometimes try to extend the glaze by brushing it on and really thin and then try to spread it out as much as they can, that's not helpful at all. I like to load up the brush, unload the brush, load up the brush, unload the brush. So I'm getting a generous amount of the glaze on there as I go. And on the jar, you know, the instructions on the jar says three generous coats. Now what they're trying to encourage you to do is to apply plenty of underglaze because what you may not know in the beginning is that what you see is not what you get. It may look very opaque, but if you don't apply at least two or three coats, um, it's going to look real washy and um, incomplete or amateur looking. So what you're seeing me do is applying the first coat. Um, let's see, another thing that I can show is how I actually mix the glaze if I want it to have a more saturated color. Sometimes the colors that come in the uh, store are um, a little, I uh, don't have quite as much uh, actual pigment in it. In glaze, they, we, we don't have pigment, we have what's called mason stains. So another advantage of working on the palette, like a painter, is I can actually boost the uh, intensity or the saturation of the color by adding more mason stain to the, to the underglaze in this way. Sometimes I'll even use a, I'll even use a neutral base um, as my, uh, uh, well, it is what it sounds like, the neutral base that I add color to. So I've just boosted the intensity of this um, so that I'm sure I'm going to get um, the color I want without it looking all washy. You don't have to worry about getting glaze on the bottom of the piece because I said glaze, I really meant to say underglaze. Underglaze is not a glaze, so it's not going to melt to the shelf. So you just don't need to worry about that.